Good evening, one and all. 170 years ago, Charles Dickens wrote a little book immortalizing the holiday we know and love as Christmas. But the true story of that book and how it came to be is as interesting as the book itself. Step back with me now to 1843. It was, to borrow Dickens' own words, the worst of times. <laughs> Here is Dickens in his prime. Average height, smooth-faced, looking as he did before the beard and the unruly hair that you've seen in the pictures. At 31, he was already the most successful and best-loved novelist of his day, having produced such works as Oliver Twist, Nicholas Nickleby and the Pickwick Papers. But installments of his current novel weren't selling as expected, and his publisher was nervous. But I don't understand. Mr. Dickens, let me be clear. If people don't start buying your latest book, we shall have to reduce your weekly advance. But this is my finest work. And there were other troubles. For years, Dickens had used his money to support worthy causes and needy family members. Hey, calm now, brother. What's 20 pounds to you? <laughs> you have more than you could ever need. Alfred, our situation is desperate. Soon, we'll have nothing left. Oh, Charlie. To make matters worse, Dickens' wife, Catherine, was expecting. Charles, we're soon to have our fifth child. Can I not even have the semblance of a proper nursery? Kate, my dear, please try to understand that in three months we may not even have the semblance of a proper house. With a heavy mortgage, mounting bills, and the cost of maintaining his public presence, Dickens was on the brink of bankruptcy. My love, what will become of us? What will become of our children? <laughs> that autumn, Dickens walked the streets of London. Night after night, mile after mile, he looked into the faces of London's poor, and he saw the spectre of what might be. Aunt! Aunt! Watch it, mister! Oh, it's a proper gentleman. Spare a bob, will you, sir? Passing dingy basement windows, caked in soot and dripping with condensation, he was haunted by a memory from his own impoverished childhood. His father was dragged off to debtor's prison, and 12-year-old Charles was taken from school and required to labor in the dismal dungeon of a boot-blacking factory. Shrinking from his father's fate, Dickens closed his heart, his mind, and his purse. As he walked the narrow alleyways and empty park lanes, alone, depressed, hands in his pockets, his mind worked on his problem, as his problem worked on him. What could I write quickly? A brief tale, one volume. Finished? In time for a holiday gift? Yes, let me see. With each step, an idea began to take shape in Dickens' mind. Why not bring all of this to life? The story of a man so preoccupied with money that he cannot appreciate the joy of family and friends. A man so fearful of ignorance and want, he cannot embrace the abundant beauties of life. Emboldened by his idea, Dickens sequestered himself in his study and began to write. The central character, a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge, ah, humbug, Billet, with a dead business partner who regrets his own miserly ways, Jacob Marley. I wear the chains I forged in life. Him. And a clerk, Bob Cratchit, his wife, his family, sickly son, a nephew, and a whole myriad of debtors, all of them suffering, because Scrooge sees only himself and his own needs. How to give Scrooge 
a new vision of his life and the people around him, a vision that will change his heart. He would need a helper, a guide, and Dickens provided one by reviving a character he had originally created for another story, a ghost, though he was far from ghoulish. A jolly giant. He comes with a, with a sparkling eye, genial face, open hand, joyful air. We're getting there. What does an author learn from the characters he's inventing? How might a genial ghost change the way Dickens sees the world? This is where I come in. Charles! What is it? Who are you? Come in. Come in and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Yes. Let me get this down. Put it away. Look at yourself. Day after day, you hold on to your pen, clutching tightly to the world as you know it, afraid to leave it behind for something better. Afraid? But I... Yes. And yet, here you are, approaching the season when hope and abundance should fill your heart. You mean Christmas? Indeed. At least you've not forgotten that. Oh, I've always seen Christmas as a wonder, sir. What with all its merriment and whatnot? You've seen practically nothing. I haven't. No, you haven't. Look out there. I can't see anything. Well, of course you can't. From where you are, there's nothing to see but yourself. Hold on to my robe. Come on now, a breeze. <laughs> 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 The wonder. Seeing things as they really are. Look! Look at the city from here! Yes, and what you see, my I good man. I see houses and houses. So many houses. Because there are so many people. People, yes. And all of them buying books. Oh, it's not about books. <sighs> see the people, Charles, with their lives. Lives? And troubles like you. Ah, look at the lights. Yes. And the river. Oh, yes. The Houses of Parliament, Big Ben, and the Abbey. Yes, much is familiar. But come, what haven't you seen oh, before? It's all so very still. Yes. And beautiful. Indeed. <sighs> now look. Look out there, Charles. It's a place where miners live who labor in the bowels of the earth. And yet, with all their want, they know me. They know Christmas. They do? Look, a cheerful company is assembled round the fire. An old man and woman with their children and their children's children, all decked out gaily in their best attire, singing a Christmas carol. They are so poor, they haven't anything at all but each other. It's true. Now go on, Charles, fly on. There's more for you to see and see for yourself. We're leaving behind the land, the rocky crag, the water. Look. A lighthouse. See within the loophole of the thick stone wall, that ray of brightness on this awful sea. I see a man and his wife, rough hands, faces scarred by the hard weather. They too sing a carol. How happy they seem to be. Ah, now you're beginning to get a glimpse of it. On you go. Across the black and heaving sea, far away from any shore. Oh, a ship! Yes! You see the helmsman at the wheel, the lookout in the bow, the officers in the watch. <laughs> a 
Every man among them hums a Christmas carol or has a Christmas thought. And speaks below his breath of Christmas with homeward hopes. Christmas in their hearts, and it's enough for them. Yes, yes, now on, on. London again. Huh. The Marble Arch. Kensington Gardens, look, the Thames. But what do you see, Charles? What do you really see? Oh, there. I see an orphanage, a workhouse yard, with so many poor, miserable orphans. So pitiful in there. They're singing. In their wretched condition, singing. Yes, Charles, even them. But come on now, man, see everyone. Oh, I do. It's my business to see, you know, and to write about it. Like that gentleman walking there with such great expectations, and a seamstress. And a lame boy, and that gentleman walking in the street there. Yes. Yes, what about him? Hands in his pockets, head bowed low. He's not singing, I can tell you. Look again. Look closely, Charles. It can't be. It's me. It is. And what are you doing down there? I'm walking, scheming, plotting, thinking that money can solve my problem, convincing myself that publishing a little Christmas book could relieve all my woe. And can it? No! <laughs> Not finally. Not forever. But you can. You have. I have? Yes. Christmas. Now. Here. In the present. Good spirit. I see. Now. I do see. Come then. Let us go home. I must do more than simply write of Scrooge and Cratchit and Tiny Tim. I must learn what they learn and live it. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. Sir, I cannot thank you enough. It's not too late for Scrooge. Then it's not too late for you. Off you go now, man. Hmm? You have a little book to finish. Yes. Yes! <laughs> and you'll be in it. <laughs> Let me see. How did it go? Come in, exclaimed the ghost. Come in and know me, better man! <laughs> That autumn of 1843, as Dickens dipped his pen and filled his paper, something happened to him. His little story, which he had intended as a means to reclaim his wealth, turned out to be the instrument for recovering his faith in others and his hope in the future. Each morning, he awoke eager to begin the day's work, to fill his story with the Christmas spirit he had discovered anew. He poured out all of his experience, all of himself, into the writing. I was reluctant to lay the manuscript aside, even for a moment. I wept <laughs> and laughed and wept again. In time, Dickens' fortunes were reversed, and he went on to write among the most notable works of his career. But nothing would equal the literary artifact 
of his own Christmas awakening. Whether by ghost or no, there, on the streets of London, in the midst of insecurity and confusion and fear, Charles Dickens discovered the Christmas spirit for himself. The words of Scrooge's nephew are his own. I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time when it comes round as a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow travelers to the grave uh, and beyond. <laughs> and, and, and though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it! To which we add, God bless us, everyone!